Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Professor Williams and I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the p-value. Um, it really is more than just a vegetable. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in statistics. When we talk about this concept of a p-value, what we're really talking about is this area under the normal curve that falls beyond your calculated test statistic. So when you have a value of z that is calculated from the sample data under your hypothesis test, the p-value is this entire area either to the right in the case of a one-tail test or could be the area down here to the left in a left-tail test or in a two-tail test it would be both of these areas. It's simply the area beyond the calculated test statistic and what it truly represents is the probability of obtaining a test statistic that is at least as extreme as the calculated value. So at least as extreme as the calculated value. But the p-value actually represents something that's almost more important. Since the p-value is calculated from the observed sample, we calculate the p-value from the sample data we draw, it represents the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. Remember that is a type 1 error. That type 1 error rejects a null hypothesis that is true. In other words, we can say that it's the probability of obtaining a difference at least as large as the one between the observed value and the hypothesized value through random error alone. So it's the idea of getting a difference of at least as large as the one between what we observed, our x bar, and the hypothesized value, mu, just by a mistake or by random error. So how do I actually find one of these p-values? Well, you probably already done it, you just didn't know that was what you were doing. I'm going to calculate my test statistic, and then I'm going to need to isolate that area beyond the test statistic. And then I'm going to compare the p-value to alpha. We remember our rule for p-value. If p is greater than alpha, do not reject HO. If p is less than alpha, reject HO. Remember, if P is low, HO must go. So, for example, I have collected data, I've calculated a test statistic, and it ends up being Z of 1.25. Going to my standard normal distribution table, I'm going to find the Z score of 1.25, and I see that that's associated with this area of 0.3944 and based on this table I know that 0.3944 is the area under the curve that falls between the mean and my calculated test statistic which in this case is a Z. I'm now going to come back over to my normal curve. I have my Z score located here at 1.25 probably not to scale I know that each half of this normal distribution curve contains 50% of the data in total. So this half on this side is the other 50%. I was told from my normal distribution table that 0.3944% of the data in a normal curve will fall between the mean and a z-score of 1.25, simply saying that between the mean of a normal distribution and 
1.25 standard deviations above the mean, I'll find 0.3944% of my data. Since the p-value is the probability of finding something more extreme, something beyond my observed z statistic, I'm going to take and subtract from the 0 0.5 the 0.3944 that falls between my z-score and the mean, I will come up with a p-value of 0.1056. I will then take my p-value and compare it versus, whoops, period, versus alpha, and I will make my decision. What I know, looking at it right away, is that at a p-value of 0 0.10, hmm, not looking good for my data. But the important thing is for you to understand not just how to find it, but what it represents. So remember that the p-value isn't just a vegetable. It is the probability that we make a type 1 error or it is the probability that we get a test statistic that is at least as extreme as the calculated value if the null hypothesis is true. So I hope this made things better. Eat your vegetables and I'll see you guys around.